Hello, my name is Phil Schrock. I'm the Ultrasonic Testing Level 3 here at Laboratory Testing. We often get asked, how small a defect can you find? And that's a good question about laboratory testing's capabilities. But our capabilities aren't really what you're interested in. You're interested in the assurance that your material will perform properly in service, that it doesn't have any defects which would cause it to fail unexpectedly. So the real question is one we need to ask you. How large a defect do you need to find? What is your critical flaw size? For this presentation, I'm going to assume you've already determined that. So how small a defect can we find? I'll give the classic engineering answer. It depends. It depends on multiple material characteristics. The most important ones are the alloy, how it was processed, how it was heat treated, the surface finish, and the overall geometry. There are other factors, but these are the important ones, and I'll give examples of each in a little while. First, I want to briefly explain how ultrasonic testing works. We use a device called a transducer, which converts electrical pulses into sound waves, to put high-frequency sound, we call it ultrasound, into the material. Ultrasound can find much smaller defects than audible sound. The sound bounces off of surfaces in the material, edges, defects, sometimes grain boundaries, and some of it returns to the transducer. The transducer turns it back into an electrical signal which we can display on our test instrument. We call a part of that signal an indication, so we get an indication from any defects, from the surfaces of the material, sometimes from grain boundaries. These indications show us how much sound returns and when it returns, and from those we can determine where a defect is and get an idea how big it is. Here's a typical UT setup where the transducer is in contact with the test material. Not surprisingly, we call this contact UT. That gel you see on the pipe helps the sound get into the pipe. Here's a typical setup where the transducer and a portion of the test material are underwater. The water helps the sound get into the material just like before. But with this system, we can use multiple transducers, test a lot faster, and find smaller defects. The compromise is that these systems, we call them immersion UT systems, only work with round material that's under about 7 inches diameter. For solid round bar, we can perform a test along the radius of the bar, and we'll rotate the bar so we test over the entire surface. We'll compare any signals we get to the signal we get from a flat-bottomed hole we drilled in a short section of the bar. A hole like this makes a distinct indication on our instrument, and the hole itself is fairly simple to make. We call this a reference standard. We compare the indications from the defects we find to the indications we get from this artificial defect. For tubing, we can perform a test looking around the circumference of the tube, and a separate test looking up and down the length of the tube. We do this by making the sound enter the material at an angle. Our reference standard for this test will be a set of notches on the inside and outside surfaces. These notches are typically made using electrical discharge machining. As before, we compare the indications from the notches to the indications in the test material. Let's look at alloys for a moment. Carbon steel and aluminum are generally very easy materials to UT. Metallurgically, there's not much going on with them no strange grain structures, no odd precipitates, so sound travels through these materials without too much trouble. By contrast, 6,4 titanium has multiple grain structures which are affected by all kinds of processing parameters. This complicated structure tends to absorb and disperse sound, so we need to put more sound into the material and amplify the return sound more in order to get usable signals. This means our signal is much noisier and more difficult to read. How the material is processed can make a huge difference. Castings are generally more difficult to UT than forgings, in large part because of the varying grain structures in castings. Even the forging process can make a big difference. For tubing, processing problems like scratches and seams can generate lots of apparent noise and indications that aren't really defects. Wall thickness variations can also make testing more difficult. I'll talk more about that when we get to material geometry. The surface roughness can have some effect on how much sound can get into the material. In general, a rougher surface lets less sound in, 
so we like the material to be as smooth as reasonable. 250 RA is a typical maximum permissible roughness. That's somewhere between fine and medium sandpaper. And it's important that the reference standard we use be no smoother than that. Geometry can have the largest effect on how UT can be performed. Thicker material requires more sound energy, which usually means more noise. On very thin material, it can be difficult to distinguish a defect from the reflection from the back of the material. For tubular products, an extremely high OD to ID ratio can make for a challenging test, as we need to be more clever about aiming the sound in the necessary direction to detect defects on the ID surface. Angles and holes and keyways and other machined features can make UT difficult if not impossible. The test system doesn't know the difference between a machined slot that's supposed to be there and a crack that isn't. Bent tubing can be a big challenge, and the bend doesn't need to be very severe to be a problem. When bent material runs through our immersion systems, it can knock the transducers out of position, it can cause the sound beam to enter at a different angle, and it really slows testing down even if these other effects don't happen. This is one of the most common material problems we see. Changes in wall thickness, especially when they're significant changes, can cause real trouble. In most cases, the thickness change will run in a spiral path around the tubing. The internal contour caused by this can make testing for wall thickness and for defects much more difficult. In some cases, we can't perform the testing at all. Let's look at a few typical test situations where these elements are important, starting with the easiest. A simple test on steel plate. We send the sound straight into the plate, and it comes straight back, and we see how much sound was lost by observing the indication from the back surface of the material. A test like this will find large, spread-out defects like laminations. Here's a similar test being performed on round bar. The round contour makes the test a little more difficult, but the principles are all the same. Let's go back to the plate, but instead of just looking for the back reflection, let's also set up on a quarter-inch diameter hole for reference. So now we can look for places where the back reflection goes away, and also look for smaller defects. The size of the hole is very important. Setting up and testing with a quarter-inch diameter hole in a steel plate one inch thick is fairly easy. Setting up on a 3 sixty-fourths inch hole on a four-inch thick plate is much more difficult. The smaller the hole required, the more difficult the testing becomes. We can do a similar test on round bar with similar characteristics. A smaller hole is more difficult to find. We can also have the sound enter the material at an angle. This is better for finding crack-like defects. The notch can be a variety of depths, depending on the governing specifications. Naturally, a shallower notch means a more restrictive test. A test on pipe and tubing will look somewhat similar to an angle beam test on plate, with similar challenges with similar notches. One important advantage to immersion testing of tubing is that we can test in multiple directions at the same time. We have the capability to detect some very small notches in tubing. One specification uses notches which are three thousandths of an inch deep and an eighth of an inch long. Another uses a notch two thousandths of an inch deep and a sixteenth of an inch long. The smallest we regularly find is two thousandths of an inch deep and thirty thousandths of an inch long for a very specialized application. So when you're reading your testing specifications in general, any flat bottom hole three sixty-fourths inch or smaller will be tricky to find. Any notch less than four thousandths of an inch deep or about three percent of the material thickness will be tricky to find. Tricky, not necessarily impossible. That depends on all those other factors. One final point. Good material, with good workmanship, is usually fairly easy to test. And when that happens, everyone does well. Laboratory testing is always happy to discuss your testing needs. For your ultrasonic questions, please call or email me, and I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thanks for watching.